please turn with me to the text we, we read, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 10, the fifth book of the Bible and chapter 10. Deuteronomy, the law a second time. That's the meaning of the word Deuteronomy, the law of God a second time. I'm going to read verse 12, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. I have a, a simple title. Uh, to our study tonight, it's simple spiritual prerequisites. I have to use the word simple, but don't let that word mislead you. It is simple because it comes from God. If it was the concoction of man, it will be very, very laborious. It will be complicated. And you have or you are in danger of wearing your brain. But because God has given us his word, his commandments, we read from the word of God, are not burdensome. The Lord Jesus said, take my yoke, it is light. So the commandments of God are not to make us to be heavy people. <coughs> They are to be obeyed. And even a child can live the Christian life. But it is so hard that the most mature of us still needs the help and the dependence on the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of his spirit and his word to be able to live just a day of Christian life. So simple spiritual conditions or prerequisites are given to us in this, in this passage. My dear friends, Old Testament and New Testament are here presented to us in perfect harmony. When I read this text, I feel I was reading the New Testament. Actually, we could go through many, many passages, and this is not just to impress you. We could really spend the rest of the day just taking parallels parallels of different passages who are saying exactly the same as what we have read here in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. But my dear brothers and sisters, remember, there must be visible signs in a believer's life. Visible signs. Otherwise, we will wonder if the person is converted at all. And these signs are personal. Each one of us must have those palpable and tangible signs in his life. But the signs are also or must also be visible for the church as a whole. And hopefully, by the help of the Lord, we are going to explain that. So the verse says in verse 12, Israel, and now Israel, what doth the Lord requires from thee? Israel of God, of course. The church, Galatians chapter 6. Israel, the church is the Israel of God. But that's the collective uh, aspect, all of us. But Christian, we can say, what does the Lord require from you and me? Individually, but also as, a, as, a church, as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The essence of true religion, of saving religion, of genuine religion is a matter of the heart. It must be a matter of the heart. Otherwise, if it's just something external, it means nothing. But true religion must be a matter of the heart in obedience to God. And when you read verse 17, it says in verse 17, 
For the Lord your God is God of gods. There is only one God. There is only one triune God. There is only one saving God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father planned our salvation. The Lord Jesus Christ purchased our salvation. And the Holy Spirit performs in you and me, in your soul, that salvation. That's why there is no other saving religion. You can study all of them. You will not come out with one saving religion except the religion of the Bible. My brothers and sisters, after 40 years, after 40 years wandering in the wilderness, the people will soon be entering in the promised land. But what to do? How should they behave? The sovereign Lord, the only God, set the rules. That's why I said it's not man's uh, fabrication. It is God who sets the rules from the beginning. And here, in our Bible study tonight, I would like to put before you five requirements. But you see, before you are able to do those requirements, it says that the Lord must be thy God. He must be your God. So I'm not speaking about morals. I'm not speaking about advice. I'm not giving you advice. I, I have no advice. People ask, oh, what advice do you give? What do you think? I think nothing. If it's not in the word of God, it's not, it's nothing. We don't have wisdom by ourselves. The only wisdom are in Christ. Colossians chapter 2, verse 3, it says in him, there are all the treasures of wisdom. If it's not in the Bible, it is not wisdom at all. It's man's idea. It's man's philosophy. It's man's speculation. Run away from it. Flee as much as you can because it won't do any good to your soul. And my dear brothers and sisters, these five requirements are so important because God expects fruits in your life and in my life. Yes, you can have uh, seedless grapes, you can have seedless fruits or whatever you want without seeds, but you cannot have a seedless Christian. There must be, because the seed, the incorruptible seed, the imperishable seed has been sown in you. And when that seed, that uh, divine seed is dropped in the soul of a sinner, you come into repentance. You come in before the Lord in trembling with joy, certainly, and you will bear fruit because the word of God is dropped in a good ground. But remember, the seed, once you have it, if you leave it in a basket, will not bring anything. But to encourage you, God said in Isaiah 55 that his word will not go back to him void. So we plant the seed. So God gives us these requirements. And my brothers and sisters, they are not expectations. They are not suggestions. And as you know, God makes no suggestion. God makes no suggestion. He has only obligations. And this is very important in our world today. There is, it is not optional. <laughs> That's why there is no elite in the church. What is applicable to a church officer is applicable to all, all believers. So these commandments, these requirements, as I alluded to it earlier, they come again and again throughout the scriptures. So that's why I said, we are in the Old Testament, but it is as if we were reading the New Testament. Before I come to them, one just last thing to build up again my introduction. My dear brothers and sisters, in these five requirements, it is a chain. Not one single link should be missing, should be missing or weakened. 
If one is missing, they fall like a castle of cards, and it won't do you any good. If you weaken them, you will deprive yourself from the blessings of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here they are, because they are related to our inward and outward life. So in these five requirements, we are speaking about your life, your spiritual life, but also your attitude, your conduct, your behavior, your behavior in the church, but also in the society. Without any further ado, I, I hope, I, hope uh, 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 I, I, made, I made you to, 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 to hear what is coming. <laughs> but the first one, it's all in the text. If you ever listen to any one of my sermons, I repeat myself, I said, I don't invent anything. It's all in the text. And if you have never heard it, run away. There is nothing new. So we keep repetition is a part of pedagogy. It's a part of teaching. So the first thing in verse 12, my dear friends, these are commandments for, from God. It's not even from Moses. Moses has received them from God. And the first one, it says in verse 12, and now Israel of God, you and me, and now Christian, and now the church of the living God, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord your God. We have many fears. Many fears. If you don't have any fear, it means you are not human. Fear started with sin. We don't have time to read the verses, but you go back to Genesis chapter 3, the first thing, which among the first many things that happened to Adam and Eve when they sinned against the living God, God was seeking after Adam. Uh, where are thou? Oh, Adam hid. Why did he heed? As an answer to the Lord, he said, I heard thy voice, and I was afraid. And I'm sure I don't need to know anyone here. We have so many fears. Fear of the dark, fear of the height, fear of uh, life-threatening situations, fear of cataclysm. Fear of a catastrophe or a catastrophe somewhere happening. Fear of drought. Fear of death. Fear of losing a, a dear one. Fear of losing your job. Fear of illness. The list could be endless. But my dear friends, there is one fear that is vital. Fear the Lord. And I believe in my small experience that this is what is wanting, this is what is lacking in our world. There is so much shallowness. There is so much flippancy. There is so much carelessness. There is so much lightness in our world. Why? Because Bible says the ungodly has no fear in his heart. And it even says there is no fear of God in their eyes. And sometimes you meet a non-believer, you know him by his eyes. You don't even have to read. We are not heart readers, but you know the arrogance, the pride, the presumption in the person's heart. You can read those things, and especially as soon as he speaks, you know where he's coming from. So my dear friends, why all the evil in this world? You don't have to be a prophet because there is no fear in people's heart. Do you remember why the flood came in Genesis chapter 6, verse 8 and 9? Why? Because the thoughts and the imagination of men were wicked. Wicked. And from cover to cover, Bible says we live in a wicked world. Without, without the fear of God, my brothers and sisters, 
your worship will be affected. The lack of fear in a believer's, in a believer's life will make his service to be shallow, drugging, not done with joy. Without the fear of God, the church will just be a club. Nice place to be, to have fun. But remember, the church is not for my happiness. Yes, if the Lord grants me happiness, that's fine. But it is for my godliness. It is to make me to fear God. It is to make me to love the Lord. But what does it mean to fear God? What does it mean? Very simple definition. We know to fear God is to have a childlike loving fear. A childlike loving fear. So, which means, when we say fear God, please, we are not speaking about uh, irrational, unreasonable, threatening, frightening, that kind of terrifying. Oh, yes, a sinner should be terrified to stand before the living God, the holy God. Remember, one of the attributes of God who is uh, thrice said, you, you, nowhere you see it, God is love, love, love. God is mercy, mercy, mercy. But when it comes to his holiness, just to wake up uh, and to stir in us a, a, a fearful heart, it says, holy, holy, holy. This is the God before whom Moses has to, 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 has to, had to take off his shoes. This is the God. You take any godly man in the Bible, he was a God-fearer. From Moses to the Apostle John, from Genesis to Revelation. So we are not speaking about servile and slavish fear. No. We are speaking about a happy, holy humble respect and reverence for God. Remember, this is God. You are, you are, sometimes people ask me, explain to me God. If I can explain to you God, he must really be a small God. There is no way for you. This is God who fills heaven and earth. You know what the Bible says? Just imagine, he is sitting in heaven and the earth is his footstool. This must be a great God. My dear friends, why am I telling you this? We are small people. Oh, yes, I know. We all have our tendencies. We all think we are special and original. But we are small people. So better reverence, better honor, better Respect the one who made you. You know, we often say, God is our father. Yes, but please add, he is our holy father. He is our divine father. He is our heavenly father. But remember, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, God is also our judge. But remember, this is family judgment. God is not looking, oh, Satan wants to get the worst out of you, but God wants to judge the best in you. That's the difference. So it is always better for a child of God to fear the Lord. My dear friends, once, once God converts you and me, doesn't matter how old you are. As soon as you are converted, one of the first things that God does, he puts his fear in your heart. He puts his fear in your soul. And you are not the same anymore. Oh, God is a loving God. But he puts that fear in your heart. In the early church, the people, the believers, walked in great fear. I don't have time to show you the verses, but you can read them for yourself. Acts chapter 5, verse 11. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. You can see the people were living and walking with God in all fear. 
and even because of the fear, or the genuine fear, the godly fears in believers, outsiders were reluctant to join them. Why? Because they saw great power and great grace among them. Nowadays, nobody fears the church because we are all playing a game. I'm sorry to say all. It's generalizing, but we want to be different because of the fear of God in our lives. My dear brothers and sisters, to fear God means to know him, to love him. To fear God means to conduct our life godly and healthy. To fear God means what? Fear sin. Please fear sin. Fear disobedience. Fear backsliding. Are you, uh, have, you, have you started to backslide? And backsliding starts with what? I skip my devotions. I skip my prayers. I skip attending the, the services. This is how backsliding starts. And suddenly, you are in trouble. And it's, oh, where is God? Because you have left aside the means of grace. Or the fear of not serving the Lord. The fear of being a stumbling block to other people. I hope this is, this is practical. You can see in your own life. No, I don't want to be a, a stumbling block to anyone. I don't want to be a stumbling block to believers. I don't want to be a stumbling block to non-believers. Because the non-believers are saying, oh, the churches, look at them. They are full of hypocrites. They don't even say they are full of sinners, which is a reality. Full of sinners. But the fear of God must be really present. Work your salvation. Philippians chapter 2. Work your salvation with fear and trembling. Fear, the fear of God in you and me, will fight pride. It will fight presumption. The fear of God in you will promote humility. I, I wish I have, I have more time to tell you more. But remember, humility is not weakness. It is great power. Because then you become an instrument in the, in the hands of the living God. My dear friends, the church should be a place where the, there is the fear of God. When, when you, you look at the tele-evangelists, around the world today, there is no fear in their hearts. There is no fear in their preaching. The pulpit here, somebody standing here, should really be somebody who fears God. Without it, there will be nothing done. So the fear of God is an attitude of the heart. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 29 by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. You know, the fear of God restrains us. Uh, please don't misunderstand, don't misunderstand me. I want to be kindest and the most polite person. But remember, in you and me, there is that animal part. And if we are not restrained, we lash out. We lash out. But you see, the fear of God restrains you, restricts you. That's why this world is still continuing. There is still, even in some non-believers, there is still, there is some kind of fear. Otherwise, we will devour one another. So the fear of God is so important. You want to be wise? Read later the book of Proverbs. I could have given you the passages. You want to be wise? You want to live a life of contentment? You want to live a life of peace? You, learn, you want to live a life of humility? Uh, throughout, from Je uh, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 29, till Proverbs 30, verse 31, you want to be approved? Are you a woman? Th th there, the, the Proverbs 30, verse 31 says, the woman that fears the Lord will be praised. You see? It's, uh, if, if, if I can change your mind on this, the whole Bible is about the fear of God. Of course, in that basket, there are many, many things, many strings attached. But it starts with the fear of God. Do you see, it is first in order, it is first in force, but it is first also in fruits. 
Without the fear of God, the church will be fruitless. We will be barren believers. But the fear of God will make us to be fruitful. We come boldly to the throne of grace, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. But remember, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. He's a consuming fire. So we have so many fears. We are human. We make so many scenarios. I know, I, 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 I'm saying this to myself. Many times I'm so afraid, I'm so scared. Anxiety, worries. I make scenarios, this is happening. While, while I know 95% of the, the scenarios I'm making and 95% of the things you think will happen never happen. But we still worry. You know what? You can count it. So often, God says to us, fear not. Fear not. So there is positive fear. Not, that's why I said from the beginning, we are not speaking about irrational, unreasonable, threatening, frightening fear. It is the childlike loving fear coming from, coming from God. The fear of the Lord will protect us against extremes. Holiness is accomplished by fear, fear of the Lord. Our service is blessed because of the fear of the Lord. In Psalms, so many Psalms speak also about the importance of the fear of God. The Lord pitied those, those who fear him. Let all the earth, Bible says, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe in him, of him. The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him. Please, I want, before I come to the second, I want to make something very, to say something very important. To fear God doesn't have to have a dark, gloomy face. No. Some people, and I met, I met some, they think to be godly, oh, oh, don't have a smile. That's, you, oh, you are godly then. This is not the kind of fear we are speaking about. But please, when I say be, fear God, it means be a serious person. God has purchased you. It is free, but it costs to God his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we submit ourselves to one another in the fear of the Lord. You remember the thief, the thief on the brigand, on the cross of Calvary, the malefactor, the one who was saved. Do you remember what he said to his fellow brigand? Don't, do, don't you fear God? This is a man dying. You see again how the fear of God is so important? Oh, don't you fear God? My dear friend, if you are not a believer, if you are not a Christian, I know this is a teaching service, but don't you fear God? Here today, gone tomorrow, then what? Where will you stand? What will you present before the living God? Your good works have no good at all. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I spend a lot of time on that first one because, as I said, it is first in order. It is very important. You miss, this. Is, if this is the missing link in your life as a believer, while you claim to be a believer following the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm sorry, I have to tell you something great and deep is missing. So search your heart. Go to the Lord tonight on your knees and say, Lord, please increase my fear for thee. I want to fear thee. My second in verse 12 again, it's all in the text. Moses, giving the commandment to the people of God, said, you have to fear God. That's the first one. They are all imperatives. They are commands. Did you, did, did you notice something? They are all positive. That's wonderful. God loves us so much that instead of just giving us commands, he's giving us also how to do his commands. And that's marvelous. So Moses says, 
we have to walk in all his ways. Do you see the word all there? Please underline it in your Bible. <laughs> you don't pick and choose. Some people, they think the Bible is like a restaurant. Yes, when you go to a restaurant, you order what you want. But when you come to the word of God, you don't pick and choose. <laughs> it's not selective. You take it as it is. Am I too hard on you? I hope not. Godly fear leads to godly walk. And the first thing, this reminds me, my dear brothers and sisters, we are pilgrims. Pilgrims walk. That's what we are called to do. To walk with God requires diligence. To walk with God requires attention, great attention to his voice by his word and joyful obedience to his will. To walk with God requires fellowship, closeness with him. You have to be close to God. Otherwise, far from him, you will fall in pieces. To walk with God means to walk against the flow. My dear brothers and sisters, I'm sure you heard that. The Puritans, they said only dead fish swim with the current. A living believer, a Christian, born again, saved by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, always walking with God will swim against the current. But to walk with God means also to walk heavenward. <laughs> Please allow me my childish, I call it childish illustration. Sometimes I think a believer should be somebody who is always walking head up. Why head up? Looking for the coming, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. To walk with God is to be heavenward. Why? Same direction. Same space, same speed, same goal, same purpose in life. Don't take a step and stop, move forward. That's the, the Christian life. We can spend again the rest of the night really speaking about walking. This is a wonderful illustration about the Christian life. To walk, you need balance. To, your, to walk, you need one step after, after the other. You cannot be jumping. Running is not walking. You need strength. You need health in order to be walking. But here in this verse, Moses says, we are to walk in all, in all his ways. And we are engaged, my dear brothers and sisters, we are engaged in a spiritual walk. Spiritual walk. What does it mean? <laughs> the letter of Ephesians. We are called to have a worthy walk to walk in love, to walk in wisdom, to walk as children of light. There are at least eight, nine times in the Bible there is a reference to our walk. We walk with him. Our walk bears witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are told in 1 Peter chapter 2 to walk in the steps of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we could have spent really on each one of these, a whole Bible study tonight. But you see, are you walking? With whom are you walking? Oh, walk with the Lord. You will be blessed to walk by faith, not by sight. And uh, to walk with the Lord is to talk with him and also to cast all our cares upon him. That's why... A prayerless Christian handicaps himself. A prayerless Christian is powerless. And he will be defeated. The third one. So fear the Lord. This is what God requires from you and me. The second, you are to walk in all his ways. All of them. And the third one, Moses says, to love him. Verse 12, to love him. 
This is the question, actually, put by the Lord Jesus Christ to Peter, and I believe every day, every day, the Lord is putting this question to you and me. My dear friend, the Lord Jesus is saying, do you love me? Do you love me, really? A Christian, the simplest definition, I don't know if you will read it in a book or not, but I think in my small mind again, a Christian, a definition is a lover of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, we can spend, uh, we can write a whole book about all those things, but simply what is the church? Lovers of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, first Peter one again, Peter says, ye love him, Jesus Christ, whom have ye not seen, ye love him. Though not ye see him not, yet believe in, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. You see, to love is an act of faith. <laughs> in our world today, love is all sentiments, it's all feelings. But no, 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 in the Bible, love is a, a duty. Love is a command. Love is an act of faith. Love is a determination. Love is a resolution. You won't read those things in a book, I guarantee you. But remember, love is a choice. You choose to love. Choose to love the Lord because he loved you the first. If you meet anyone loving the Lord Jesus Christ, tell him it's because the Lord has loved him first. My dear friends, why should God love me? I question myself daily. Why should he love me? Why should Christ die on the cross of Calvary for me? Because he first loved us. So we love him. Love is rooted in our new nature. It is our new nature. Please, it is as if it is your second nature now to love. To love the Lord, to love his word, to love his church, to love his person, to love him for who he is, not just what you get from him. Some people, they love God because, oh, I have an exam, I have an interview, or I ha I'm traveling, be with me. That's the only reason for which is a magician. You know, God is a servant unto them, but we love the Lord for his person. Do you love the Lord? Do you love the brethren? He who loves is born of God, Bible says. Love is so important. We love one another. And God here is jealous. He demands all our love. Please don't love a sermon. I met people, they love a sermon. They worship, they are idolaters of sermons. Or, may I say something? Please don't love the Bible more than you love the Lord. That's bibliolatry. <laughs> I don't believe in bibliolatry. You, I worship the Bible. No, we worship the Lord only. We learn from his word. But don't misunderstand me. This book doesn't only contain the word of God. It is the word of God. Don't love a preacher more than you love the Lord. I met again believers, preach idolatry. Oh, this is my idol. Even if not, they have a big picture of him in the morning, they, as soon as they wake up, good morning, my idol. No, don't have a preacher. Preachers are models, not idols. They are examples to us, hopefully. But we don't worship anyone more than we worship the Lord. The Lord only, you see, only him and no one else. I'm sorry, Pastor, I'm, I, I'm not counting the time. When it's over, give me a sign. So it's important that you love the Lord. You love the Lord. Or do you love the Lord? You know, Peter has to be asked three times. Sometimes parents or children ask their parents, Mom, do you love me? <laughs> but the Lord is asking us the same, the same question. It's the way, all the way around, you know. Do you really love me? Oh, if you love the Lord, you will hate evil. Evil breaks the heart of a believer. 
We sin, I know. But when you, a believer sins, it's like his world is upside down. He wishes that earth opens and swallow him. No believer should entertain sin. No believer should sin in cold blood. Oh, that's a disaster. No believer should plan to sin. What a tragedy when a believer plans those things after being redeemed. But remember, if I could encourage you with this, you know what the Bible says? Nothing will separate us from the love of God manifested in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can read later Romans chapter 8, 17 things are listed there. Nothing, even death will not separate me from the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, what a great savior we have. We should love him. And uh, service is about love. My dear friends, we are happy servants with pure motives, pure motives. We serve the Lord. That's why I'm sure uh, Pastor uh, 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 Jonathan Norden have, have told you, nobody should be dragged to serve the Lord. Voluntarily, we serve him because he has done so much for us. So serve the Lord, love the Lord. We love him. And if you really love him, John 14, verse 15, obey his commandments. The fourth one, which I anticipate first, fear the Lord. Second, walk in all his ways. The third one, love him alone. And the fourth one is serve him. Please look at the verse, verse 12. It is qualified. Your service for the Lord is qualified with all your being with your heart, with your soul, with your mind, with your will. Leftovers won't do. God is not after our leftovers. He, he wants the primal of, all, of us. He wants the best of us because he has given us the best. You know, sometimes when I think about what God did for me, I put it this way. God gave us God. You give to people something, but God gave us a person. So serve the Lord with all your talents. Serve him sacrificially with all your time, with all your energy. We are servants. If you love, you will serve. That's how it goes. And you know what Joshua said? As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. I, I believe that should be the motto. Now it doesn't mean anything. People have it in their homes, but they are not serving anything <laughs> except themselves. But if you love the Lord, you will serve him. And the last one, to keep his commandments. Verse 13 now, in verse 13, to keep his commandments and, uh, and uh, all his statutes. Genuine love is obedient love. So the fifth one is to obey the Lord, to keep his commandment. It is good to obey the Lord. Remember, we were children of disobedience. We were children of rebellion. We were children of wrath. But once saved, we become children of light. We become children of God and children of obedience. Wonderful name. Are you obedient? Am I obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ? We are to bring every thought captive to the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. No level of maturity. Some believe, oh, I have been a Christian now for 50 years. I can relax. No level of maturity should make you to, be, to relinquish from complete and total obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody is immune. Nobody will receive a degree to say, that's it. Until you are put in the grave, you obey and you keep his commandments. Obedience is better than sacrifice, Bible says. Obedience. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the conclusion. 
and the whole matter of the whole duty of man. My dear friends, I close by saying this. These things are a part of our life as believers, saved people. We are to examine our hearts. Only pray that God will help you to examine your own heart. Work on these things. Implement them. Apply them to your own life. You see, the motive, I, I close my Bible, you close yours, but if you read verse 13, you can see God's intention why he gave us these five requirements. You know, God has a good intention. What did he say there? For our good. For our good, your good. So God is not a killjoy. You see, some people say, oh, oh, if I become a Christian, life will be so miserable. No, it's the world which makes us to be miserable. But these things will make your life to be productive. These essentials, if they are in your life, they promote humility, they sustain humility. They sustain instrumentality, they sustain holiness, and they will make our life to produce abundant life. And these essentials will make your life also to be ready to face the Lord one day, to be with the Lord. Fear the Lord. Walk in all his ways. Love him. Serve him and keep his commandments and his statutes. So may the Lord bless these words into our hearts tonight. Let's close uh, our time together by singing hymn number 521. 521, a wonderful hymn. Oh, for a closer walk with God, a calm and heavenly frame. Oh.